perspective. Oh, uh, there's the unexpected, the adventure. And at the, and at the very end, you know, you don't know who's going to survive, but someone survives till the end. And so it kind of reminds me of, of the butterflies is that they've been around a very long time. And if we, we, I'm going to start kind of going through this, um, but they've been around a long, long time. Um, up here on the left, these are just some of these that I found on the internet. Uh, they've been discovered in the Dominican Republic um, 15, 25 million years ago. And then there was one that I found a few years ago in a fossil that they, they believe dates back to 48 to 50 million years ago. And you can actually see, if you look at this fossil, I mean, you can see, I mean, it looks like one of our, wow. you know, uh, skipper butterflies or hackberry. I mean, you can actually see the spots and everything in the fossil. Hmm. Um, the other thing, and I was looking at it recently because I've, I've been doing this presentation for, for quite a while. And I, I found an article um, recently on, on how in Germany, or I think in the, yeah, they were looking at German rocks. Maybe it was in the Netherlands that they've come across some fossilized scales that they believe are from a butterfly or possibly, you know, could be a moth that, that would date back to 200 million years ago. And, mm -hmm. you know, again, they're always learning new things, um, but that would put it, I think, in the Triassic period, which is, you know, the beginning of the dinosaurs. And obviously, you know, with the dinosaurs becoming extinct, the butterflies through all these periods have found ways to survive. And so what I really want to talk about today is, you know, how do they do that? You know, what are some of these mechanisms? And we're going to see it throughout their life. But, um, you know, with only like an hour or so, I'm only going to be able to share you know, a few, you know, a few or some of them. Um, but let's go ahead and go into that. Um, one of the first things that I'll say, though, when we're talking anything about butterflies is, is we need to make sure we understand the life cycle. And the life cycle is pretty simple egg, caterpillar, chrysalis, adult, but I'd like to kind of go into a little more deeply um, just from observations that I had while being a butterfly docent at the herd, which is where I learned a lot of my information. And these are pictures that I took from there. So these are examples. Somebody talked about the black and yellow butterflies. These are giant swallowtails. The giant swallowtails are our largest butterflies in our area. And what they're doing is they're mating, and this is what it looks like. So if you've never seen butterflies mating, the giant swallowtails, because their wings are so large, can't close them up like you might see monarchs or other butterflies mating. So they look very large, and again, this is kind of what it looks like. They can stay together with the clasp on their abdomens for hours. And so because the butterfly house that I volunteer is is so small, you know, we have the opportunity to see this quite often. After they mate, the, butter, the, the female butterfly is going to start laying eggs, and she's going to look for her host plant, which she detects by touching the leaves, and she can detail, she can determine the, you know, the composition of the plant to make sure it's the right one. And then you'll see she'll tuck her abdomen under and lay eggs on the leaves. And in this example, I can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six eggs that this giant swallowtail has laid. Now, normally, in most of the butterflies, you know, they're not going to necessarily lay that many on one leaf, but in the butterfly house, they don't have a lot of options. So um, we tend to get more in one area. Then the butterfly is going to hatch. I mean, I'm sorry, the egg is going to hatch into a caterpillar, and the caterpillar is going to go through multiple stages of growth. Um, here's here's um, one of the giant swallowtails. They look like, actually look like, bird poop when they're small and again that's one of their you know mechanisms to avoid being e eaten and then after it goes through four or five instars which is what they they call each growth of the caterpillar as it sheds its skin they will actually make a chrysalis and we can see i've got two examples of chrysalis um, the top one is a what we call them going into their c-shape and they've got this string, the silk harness around the middle, and they've attached a piece of silk at the bottom. And then they will shed that skin one more time, and they'll actually make the chrysalis. And if you look at this one, again, this is the giant swallowtail. Um, you know, it actually even looks like it could be a thorn on a tree or maybe a, 
you know, a piece of a branch. So they're already, you can see them starting to do um, camouflage in different ways to protect itself. Here is the swallowtail. This is in our little butterfly box coming out. And one thing that's amazing to me on this picture is look at its abdomen. Okay, this has just come out of the chrysalis. His abdomen, notice its wings are shorter than its abdomen. And within two or three minutes, this is what it looks like. Look at the abdomen. Mm. You see how much those wings have expanded? So it's pumped the wings up with fluids in its body and it expand those wings out. It will hang upside down for several hours until they harden. And then it will, right before it leaves, it, I, I, I like this picture because it reminds, it always reminds me of airplanes. You know, we got too many people on, you got to throw them off or something. But right before it takes its first flight, <clears throat> it's going to release any extra liquid. And you see that drop at the bottom of the abdomen, abdomen before it flies off. And then it starts over again. When a butterfly fly, you know, is, is born, it's full size and it can mate immediately and start the process again. Not saying that the girls want to do that, but I've seen uh, boys fly into the cage before they're even ready to try to mate. So um, that's kind of the, the life cycle of the butterfly. And during all these parts of the cycle, they're having to find ways to survive because, you know, being at the bottom of the food chain, a caterpillar, um, you know, they could be eaten at any of their stages. Their foods for um, birds, lizards, snakes, rats, ants, wasps, you know, tons of things. People picking them up to maybe not eat them, but to play with them, grow them, kill them. Um, so there's all kinds of things they have to um, try to get around during their life cycle to make it to the end. Okay, so in the beginning, as they fly out to find their mates, you know, how do they find them? You know, there's, there's, but there's, we have lots of butterflies, but how do they go about and find their mate? And one of their things is called hilltopping. And you, you see this a lot with, if you go on top of a hill, and it doesn't have to be a large hill. I know like in our area, we have a lot of flat land. So it could be a tree, you know, a tall tree, um, an opening in the woods. Um, in, you know, anything like that, but the butterflies will fly there, and look for their mates. So if anybody, like if the herd is fly, climbed on top of um, Old Baldy or, you know, the top of the mountain in the springtime, you'll actually see butterflies flying around, around up there. <laughs> All right. Another way they may find them is what's called patrolling. And if you have like a tree line or an area maybe with a a host plant, maybe some milkweed, you'll find that the male butterflies just fly back and forth and around, um, waiting for the females to come. Um, so that's called patrolling. It's another way that, that they will find each other. They may find each other, you know, around the host plants or in butterfly patches. It doesn't necessarily have to be trees. It could be maybe a butterfly garden that they found. But you'll see them periodically coming in and out, not necessarily there to feed on anything, but just just looking, you know, looking for a mate. And then once they find someone, there's what I call the dance or courting um, that you'll see. And I, I took this. This is in my my yard. But let's see if this video works here. These are two giant swallowtails. But you see how the male, the female sitting there wanting to just eat. And the male is sitting there trying to, you know, touch her wings and get her attention. Um, you'll, you'll see that. And that's what they're doing is that, you know, they're trying to, you know, court, court them into, you know, mating with them. All right. So once, um, once the, the female is ready to lay eggs, um, the eggs can be laid in a lot of different places. Um, there are lots of different shapes and sizes and colors. And, you know, they can be laid on top of a leaf. Here's, here's an example of a, this is probably the giant. Um, they can be laid on the bottom of leaves. Um, notice these are different sizes. And sometimes they're laid on the very tips of leaves because that's where the most tender growth is. And on some of these plants, this plant in particular here is passion vine. Um, and because it has those kind of like milkweed, it has those really thick sap in it. The, the tender leaves are where the, the caterpillars will find the easiest to eat. 
So you'll see them lay it where the tender growth is going to be. Um, and then this just is an example of a, you know, a different shape of an egg. Um, so there's lots of different ones of those. Now they're going to have to lay them on the host plants, you know, which is the plant the caterpillar is going to eat. So the female will fly around and use her feet to touch the plants to find the right plants. And normally they're only going to lay like one or two a plant. Um, you know, unless they're like in distress, sometimes with the monarchs flying in or migrating, you know, they've flown forever and they can't fly in milkweed and they may find one or two and they'll just what do what's called egg dumping. But normally they're they're going to do a few. And the reason for that is in some butterflies, um, if you put too many on a plant and some of the caterpillars hatch first, they will actually eat the other eggs. And so the female knows that. And so she tries not to do that. Um, now. In other, in other species, um, like the pipevine swallowtails, they do on purpose, they lay a lot of eggs together. And I've got some pictures later, but they, they have a strategy of the more we have in numbers together, the safer we will be. And so we'll see that when we look at the caterpillars. But a, a female can lay up to 400 eggs. Um, and again, I'm just, you know, there's lots of species of butterflies in our area. So I'm kind of giving you generalizations of it. Um, but in general, I'd say about 400. So they have lots of eggs and their, their hope is that some of them will survive. I mean, not all of them will, but some of them. Did I hear somebody had a question? I thought I heard something. If people do have questions, um, it's fine. You can ask in the chat, you can ask during live and then I'll, I'll ask for questions at the end as well. So. All right, so these are some examples of caterpillars. And um, in this stage, you know, they're very vulnerable. They're very tasty, you know, to lots of creatures. They have a lot of nutrition. I think when Doug Tallamy talks, he talks like, I think, was it 95 to 98% of all birds nesting will feed their babies caterpillars. And of course, a lot of those are moths, but a lot of them are butterfly caterpillars as well. And so they've got to come up with strategies. You know, they've got to come up with ways they've evolved to protect themselves. And so one of them is called, and I'm going to try to say this right, I think it's aposematism. I keep working on all these words, aposematism, um, which is the use of warning colors. And you may be familiar with that from, you know, frogs in the Amazon um, and, and, and other creatures like that. But this is what the caterpillars do as well. Those that are brightly colored, the orange, um, or also this, this one right here, the striped one, this is called, this is actually another form of a, a pattern um, that, that's a warning. It, it indicates to the other creatures that, that they're toxic. And then if you eat me, I'm going to make you sick. And so they're not as worried about hiding, although there are other creatures that can eat them, but they're not as, um, predated as much as, as the others. Um, over here on the right, this is uh, painted ladies in a, in a thistle plant, and you'll see they create this webbing. And sometimes the webbing actually curls up the leaf into like a little tunnel, and they can crawl in it, and then at night they come out and eat. Um, so that's kind of the way they protect each other. This one in the middle, this one's really interesting. This is called myrmacophily, which is the ability to, it's a symbiotic relationship with ants. And so these, which is a hair streak caterpillar, it, it survives in conjunction with the ants. The ants are not actually eating these. So I know we always think ants are bad, but they're not always bad. This butterfly caterpillar has learned to survive by secreting through these organs, they're actually at the base here, a sweet, a sweet substance like honeydew. It secretes it out while being protected by the ant. And the way that it, the ants get it to secrete is they actually use their antenna to stroke the caterpillar, which causes it to create this honey substance. And then in return for that, if any predators are on the plants or, you know, bothering it, the ants are going to try to protect it because it's kind of like, it's kind of like having a cow, I guess, right? You're milking the cow. So we don't have a lot of our butterflies like this here, but it, it's definitely something that you can see. It's really hard to find um, the hair streaks and some of the blues caterpillars because they're small. 
Um, so it, it's hard to actually observe that in the wild. Then over here on the right, um, these are pipeline swallowtails. And remember I was talking about how the female likes to lay a lot of the eggs in groupings on the pipeline. And what they do is when they hatch, they stay together up until they're probably like an inch long, kind of in this big group. So there's like what one, two, three, four, five, maybe six of those. And this is called a gregarious relationship. And so they move as one organism. And to, so to something looking to eat it, it just looks a lot larger. Um, so, you know, they're less likely going to attack something that's larger, you know, than the creature. Like if it's a, you know, a praying mantis or, you know, something like that, if it looks larger, they're less likely to do that. And so that's, I think, in our local area, and I'm really just talking about our local butterflies. There's tons of butterflies in the world. and you know, this, it would be hard to do a presentation on everything at once, but I'm, I really try to focus on the local butterflies of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, and then down here on the bottom, this is a, uh, a swallowtail butterfly, and it's actually a giant swallowtail, but all of the butterflies, all of the, all of the swallowtails have this feature. It's called an osmotarium, which is this fork-like tongue it's not really a tongue. It's an organ that will shoot out of its head and give off a scent if it's disturbed. And so it can make itself look like a snake um, or the odor can frighten something off. And again, if you've ever raised caterpillars or been around swallowtails, you've probably seen this. Um, but it, it will just shoot it out when it's frightened um, in order to scare off a predator and startle it. And then over here on the right, this is another swallowtail. Um, and again, you can see the eye spots on it. <clears throat> they actually look like, they kind of look like I drew them on there. That's actually a picture of a, a swallowtail butterfly. And, you know, it's trying to look like a snake. Many animals are afraid of snakes. So that's a common, um, that's a common animal that, that creatures try to mimic if they can. So again, these are just some of the ways that a caterpillar tries to, you know, avoid being eaten. And in the end, you know, if 10% survive to adult or whatever, that's pretty good um, because they're like, you know, nature's, you know, candy or survival for, you know, many other creatures in the food web. All right. So camouflage is, you know, another big thing um, in caterpillars and in, you know, other other stages of their life. But I just this is an interesting one. Um, this is partridge pea which is one of our native plants. And you can see on here, I've got this yellow, this is a cloudless sulfur butterfly. These are the large yellow butterflies. And so the interesting thing I find about this one is that this caterpillar has turned yellow because it is eating the yellow flowers on the plant. <clears throat> if I look at the next page, this is actually the same species of caterpillar, but it's turned green because it's eating the leaves on the plant. So you can have caterpillars turning different colors based on what material they're actually eating off the plant, which is which is pretty cool. OK, so let's talk about caterpillar mimicry. Mimicry is when other caterpillars or other creatures try to look like, um, you know, a different caterpillar at, for protection. And in this case, um, what we've got is we've got what we call the models. So you'll see on the bottom here, this is actually a monarch caterpillar. And over on the right, this is the queen caterpillar. And the reason I know the difference between the monarch and the queen is the queen has three sets of these filaments on its back, and the monarch only has the head and the tail. <coughs> Hold on a second, I'm getting over a cold. Mm. Okay, so both the monarch and the queen eat toxic plants therefore they're toxic to other animals this caterpillar at the top is called the mimic and you know to a a, a creature or a reptile or for far away it looks pretty similar i even have people in the butterfly house come and ask me about this one up top all the time because they think it's a monarch but it's actually the eastern black swallowtail and many times it's easy to tell the difference because I just ask people, well, what's it eating when they can come and ask me? 
and usually it's eaten dill or parsley, but not milkweed. But by mimicking these other two creatures, these other ones, it can save itself because other animals might not try to touch it. Now, this doesn't always work. Um, as I'm sure anybody that's raised caterpillars out in their garden, you'll find they're eaten, they get eaten. But in a lot of cases, it does. So that's what's called caterpillar mimicry. Um, <coughs> hmm. I've also got the aposematism at the bottom because the striping pattern is also a warning, you know, a warning sign. Okay, so then after the caterpillar stage, we've got the chrysalis stage. This stage is even harder because they can't move. While a caterpillar maybe can crawl under a leaf to hide, the chrysalis is going to be wherever it is once it's made. Now, one of the ways they, they can protect themselves is that if you've ever had caterpillars on your plants and you're looking for their chrysalis, you may find they're really, really hard to find. And that's because they don't normally make the chrysalis on the, on their host plants or the plants that they eat. They can crawl away a hundred feet or more to make a chrysalis. <laughs> and they also come in different shapes and sizes and colors. And, you know, this one here is one of our, um, this is one of our clout sulfur butterflies. And it's on a plant. It looks like a leaf. This gold fritillary uh, butterfly over here on the upper right can actually move. So if you touch that chrysalis, it will start to wiggle, which is very odd. Most of the chrysalis do not do that, but this particular species will do that. And then we have in the bottom here, this is a queen or a monarch chrysalis. I'm not sure which one, um, but they will, you know, the green actually fades into whatever green they're on. And even though they have all these colorful, specks of gold it looks like you know sunlight shining off of a plant very hard to find um, this one here um, giant swallowtail probably looks like a twig or a thorn off a piece of a tree and this one over here on the right i always talk about how they move this one was under a deck bench and notice how this is a pipe on swallowtail how it matched the color of the bench i thought that was interesting they don't always do that by the way but i just thought that was interesting um, one kind of little story about relocation is, is I, I had, and when I lived in Allen, <clears throat> I had a, um, passion vine on the, um, fence and I had all these thousands, I mean, not thousands, but hundreds of gold fritillaries on it. And I never could find the chrysalis. I'm out there looking in the plant, you know, all over. I'm thinking like, where are they all going? Are they all getting eaten? I just never could find them. This was in the beginning of my learnings. And then one day, it may have been the winter, I was walking down the alley on the back of the fence and there were, you know, 20, 30 all underneath the fence um, on the other side of the fence. And then I started noticing they were on the house. I found them on the side of the pool. They're on plant, you know, plant containers. So, you know, you can find them, but it's not always exactly where you would think they would be. And that's the purpose, right? It's, it's not to be exactly where their predators are going to be looking for them. So those are some examples of the chrysalis. All right, so now we're going to do a poll. We're going to see, uh, Michelle and I tried to practice this. Michelle, this is where you get either become a champion or fail. Okay, so hopefully this popped up on everyone's screen. I'm going to show a picture. Um, let me move my, which is the monitor. I'm going to show a picture, and I'm only going to show it for like, well, I mean, I only want you to look at it for like five or 10 seconds. And then I want you to pick the, the picture that you think the monarch is and answer the poll. The goal is not to be perfect here. It's like if you had five or 10 seconds to look at something and pick the monarch, what would you pick? Okay, this, that's, that's really what the purpose of this is. And then we're just going to see how, how quickly people can do this. Okay, you ready? Is everybody ready? Okay, so here's the picture. You get like 10, I'm going to count to 10. So here we go. All right, so look at the butterfly. Each butterfly is a number and click it in on your poll. Wow. And, and I don't know who does what, so it doesn't matter if you get it wrong. Just take your best guess. If somebody was to say, which one's the monarch, what would you pick? Okay. 
Okay, we got three seconds. All right, I'm going back now. Can I go back? Oh, let's see. Let me go back. How come I can't go back? There we go. Know. Okay, you got extra time. You got extra time. Okay, so let's see now if we can. Is there a way to show the results of that poll, Michelle? Uh, do y'all not see yeah. it? It. Um, let me let me take a picture before I say okay, and then because if I lose it, then I'm gonna feel real bad. Hold on. Oh, okay, okay. Let I me... think there's a way to show poll, but otherwise you can tell us. Okay, so I, I just um... maybe, well, maybe I need to submit my answer here. Okay, okay, now we're playing. Okay, I, I okay. Do y'all see it? Okay. Yeah, now I can always see it. Okay, it's probably because I didn't answer the poll. You know, I didn't know if people could see my thing. Okay, so what we got here, this is what I wanted to show. This is perfect. 57% said number one, 43% said number two, and impressed nobody said three or four, okay? So we're going to we're gonna go back to the picture here, okay? Let me close this out. And, and the reason I actually do this, by the way, is I was, I used to, when I, when I work up there at, Myers Park or whatever with, the, with those garden shows. I had this this exact same laminated slide with pictures of that, and I would ask people, and I was shocked how many people got that wrong. Um, and those are the exact photos that I used. By the way, I just had a little laminated sheet of paper. And so the answer to this, let's go to this one. Is number one. This is the this is the modern number one. So fifty three percent got it right, <laughs> and then the other forty seven percent said number two. And again, I don't know how many people answered it. But nobody said three or four, which makes sense. And since we're a nature organization, I would expect you to be closer to one or two. Now, before I um, answer the, the answer on this, we're going to do one more and then I'm going to go back because otherwise it makes the next one too easy. But we're going to do the poll again. I'm going to come back to that slide. And I'm going to show you different pictures and I want you to do the same thing. So you guys ready? You got your little thing? Okay, here's the here's the picture. So one, two, three, or four. Pick which one you think's the monarch. Wow. <laughs> That's hard. Okay, two or three more seconds. Four. Okay. Twelve have Go voted back. if we want to give them a little bit more time. Seventeen. Okay. Go ahead. Keep voting. This is what I like to look at the picture too long. All right. It looks like we've had 18 and nothing so far. 19. Last okay. time we had 21. Are we going to get those last okay. two? All right. I'll end it. We need to see the picture. That's fine. Just show it. Yeah. It's it's really more of just, it's not about, okay. So look at this one now. See, if I had, if I had answered the question, I mean, my first slide, people would have done better on this one, but. Okay, so 63% say one, 16, two, three, four, um, and we've got, you know, different ones on the other ones, okay? But, but notice there's a, a variety. It's, it's, a harder, it's a harder test when the, when the wings are shut. So let's go back, and let's go back and answer this now. <clears throat> and I'm going to go back to the first one first. Okay, so the monarch is actually number one. This is the monarch um, on there. Now, a lot of people said it was it was number two. And this one is actually the Viceroy. And so if you remember from your you know, education in elementary school or master and at school or any school, um, the Viceroy is actually mimics the monarch so that it's not eaten because, it, it, you know, it kind of takes those protections. And that's that's that um, aposematism again. Right. Um, well, it's actually not. Sorry. It, it gets that protection from that model and that mimic. That's the mimicry. Okay, so the viceroy is mimicking the monarch. The way you can tell this is the viceroy is that it has these these lines on the back. And um, you know, I used to ask people. I didn't I didn't do anything specific with the pictures to make people pick these, but I know from asking people in the past, they they picked it more based on the color. It looks more like the monarch, which I get that. But these, you know, definitely these hind wings with these extra lines is, is a dead giveaway. Um, the third one down here, nobody picked three and four. But what I was showing this aposematism is that in the adults, these all display this. These are all warning colors. So they all show that they are warning that they are toxic. They eat toxic things if you were to eat them. 
And while that's true of one, three, and four, um, it's not necessarily true of the Viceroy. Okay, and I'm going to talk about three and four on the next. We'll talk about them on the next. So in our next poll, we had people pick all of these. Um, and again, they are a little more difficult to look at. Number one, again, is the monarch. Okay. Number four is the viceroy. And again, here's this extra black line right here. Okay. You can see the monarch doesn't have that there. And then number two, this is the queen butterfly. And the queen butterfly, if I, if I go back just to show you on this one, here's the queen butterfly number four where nobody picked it because it doesn't look at all really like the monarch, right? It's very different looking. And then this is the, um, the Gulf fritillary butterfly, which again, when the wings open, doesn't look like it. If we actually shut the wings, the queen looks very similar to the, the monarch. Um, and then this is the Gulf fritillary that, you know, again, looks more similar than it did when its wings open. <clears throat> so the reason I point this out, by the way, is when we start talking about the concern about the monarchs going away, your uh, your common person out there, <laughs> excuse me again, your common person in the community thinks these are all monarchs. Hmm. And so when they see something orange flying around, they just assume it's a monarch, by the way. Um, and again, that's the same with the birds and the reptiles and the lizards. They just assume they're all, you know, those butterflies that make them sick. Now, one thing I'll just point out, just if you want kind of some ID, and we're not really doing a lot of ID on this presentation, but if you want to be able to tell the difference between the queen butterfly and the monarch when the wings are shut or open, <clears throat> the monarch's white dots are always in the black. Notice that? They're always in the black. Over here, notice there's white dots in the yellow here. Hmm. And that's the easiest way to, you know, to tell them apart when the wings are shut. It's also the same when the wings are open, but they're much easier to tell apart. And then the viceroy has this line. The Gulf Fritillary has more, of, again, these white spots are not all in black, so that, you know, you could use that same technique there as well. All right. Well, thank you guys for taking my polls. I do have another poll, one more poll, but I like polls. Okay, so we talked about how, you know, the they don't they they eat these toxic things and don't taste very good. And you know, this has been known for a long time. Um, there was a a guy named Lincoln Brower who unfortunately passed away a few years ago. Um, I think he was eighty six, um, and he had done these. He had learned this and done these studies with blue jays, and this is kind of his claim to fame. And he would feed a we would call it a naive blue jay, a young blue jay. A monarch, and you would see it's going to strip its wings off. Um, most uh, creatures do not eat the wings; they're like our hair; they don't provide any nutrients to the the predators. They they don't they don't eat the wings, and they eat the bodies. And then after about twelve minutes, after it ate that butterfly, this is what it did. And so this is a this was a famous study that was done. You can see I don't know if you can see that bird's throwing up right here. Wow! Throw up coming down. It's, it's called the barfing blue jay. And it was a big study that was done. Oh, oh sorry, I hit too sweet. It was a big study done in Scientific America. And this was actually February of 1969, um, you know, mm -hmm. that that was done. That's kind of how they were learning, you know, back, you know, when they were learning why, you know, some butterflies were being eaten, some weren't. Now, the reality is, is that, you know, a lot of people, th you know, think, you know, that, you know, oh, it's eating my monarchs. I thought they were poison, couldn't be eaten. Well, the reality is, is that if the bird ate the caterpillar and it died, it would not learn anything because it would be dead, right? So you do have birds, especially young birds that haven't learned that it makes them sick, um, that will eat, you know, things that we think are protected by, you know, the fluids in the plants, right? The glycosoids that are in those plants, like in milkweed. Um, but they still will get eaten. And, and there are certain creatures that are, you know, not affected by that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm guessing like snakes or different things may or may not be affected by that. But, but anyway, it was just a big study that's done. Um, it, it's, it's known as the barfing blue jay, if you ever hear about that. <laughs> okay, so um, Lepidoptera, which is the, the or, you know, the, let's say the, uh, is it the order? You got to remember now my scientific stuff that um, 
that butterflies are in. It may not be right, right. Maybe it's the class. Anyway, it's one of those things. But the top level of the pyramid where the butterflies are in, Lepidoptera with the uh, with the moths, it actually means scaled wings in Greek. And so if you look over here on the right, this is just like, this was done with like an electron microscope. You can see that those wings are all made up of millions of these tiny scales. And this is actually one of these tiny scales is what one of those people found when I started off to say that they might be 200 million years old that they're studying. They found one of these little scales. They didn't find the whole butterfly or anything. But um, they provide a couple of things. So one of them is is attraction, right? In the animal world, the the males, you know, are the ones that try to be pretty and more uh, colorful for the female. So it provides attraction, which is helps it get its mate. Um, it also provides um, insulation. So when temperatures get cold, most butterflies, you know, can't live below freezing or at really, really cold temperatures. So it helps provide an insulation so that if we get down to 32, 31 degrees, not all the butterflies are going to die just because it goes down to, to that amount because they're protected and maybe in a, you know, hiding inside a you know, oh, I'd say a cave, but you know, an area, thick brush and so forth. So it gives them that protection. Um, the other thing is that, you know, they do come off. So if it was to fly like maybe into a spider web, um, instead of being stuck in the spider web, the spider doesn't jump out immediately, it can actually wriggle free and some of those scales will fall off and it will allow itself to fly away. So they provide, you know, a lot of protection for the butterfly and, um, you know, I think uh, I think one of our I forget who that was, but there was some new new uh, master nat that did a a talk on the you know the scales and how they do the coloring. So like the pipeline butterflies have kind of like this bluish shine to them, but it's not actually a color on the on the wing. It's actually a reflection off those scales. <clears throat> and again, it's to make it more attractive and so on. But they get a lot of protection for that. So that's, I just wanted to make sure that we know kind of what the scales are and why they're important. Okay. Uh, all right. So we got, let's see, did I get a question here? Was that Sam that mentioned? No. Oh, well, maybe it was Sam. I'm thinking Sam Kieschnick, but it could be. I don't know. It was a, it was a new person. He, he did it. It was really fascinating. Um, so probably. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about what they eat. You know, they've always got to find food, you know, whether the weather's great, not good, et cetera. But, you know, many of us just know that they eat nectar, you know, the, the sweet liquid in flowers. But there's a lot of other things that they eat. And not all the butterflies are flower lovers, even though that tends to be where we mostly see them. You may see them on the ground. So here's like a, um, a it's like a hackberry. No, oh, it's a tawny emperor butterfly um, getting minerals out of the ground. Um, they will t take their proboscis and put them into the ground to pull up salts and different minerals. Um, here's a goatweed leaf wing on a piece of fruit. And while this one's eating fresh fruit, many of our forest butterflies will eat off rotting fruits in the, in the forest. And it's because as the fruit rots, it creates that sweeter substance um, that they like. Um, they may actually even, I know I've seen at the herd, you'll see a whole bunch of hackberry butterflies on a tree and then they'll be eating the sap um, and what's even interesting urine dung and carrion which is dead animals um, this wasn't a picture in texas i think it was arkansas or something but all these swallowtails feeding off this fish but they're not actually eating the fish you know they're they're lapping up liquids or or things oozing out of the fish and then puddling um you know you might have an area of mud with maybe some water in it and again, they're they're sapping up. Um, they're not really butterflies. Don't really drink water, but they're getting chemicals or you know maybe amino acids or you know something out of that that puddling or soil that is helping them. I always say just minerals is what they're getting. Um, so again, you know different things on that. Um, they like you know this is why when you're if you're making a butterfly garden. It's always good to have a variety of flowers. Um, many of our butterflies are short tongued, some of them long tongued, and you know, different flowers during different seasons have different shapes and lengths, and all of that contributes to, to what they eat. 
Um, at the bottom here, I just remind people that while butterflies eat a multitude of plants, our caterpillars are very dependent on their host plant. <clears throat> and most of our caterpillars are specialists and eat only one plant or plant family. So if you're trying to attract butterflies, it's always good to have not only their adult plants, but also their caterpillar plants. And then you can attract twice the, the amount to you. Hmm. All right, so um, we're going to talk a little bit about swallowtails. I'm going to do another poll. Um, these are male swallowtails. So in some of our, hmm, some of our uh, butterflies, you can tell the difference of sex based on how the, the butterflies look. But these are male swallowtails. This is a tiger swallowtail. Uh, this is a pipeline swallowtail. And, and usually the pipelines have the blue or blues on them. And then this is a eastern um, black swallowtail. Um, the only swallowtail, we've got four swallowtails in our area. The only one I didn't put on here was the giant swallowtail. That was the one um, that we saw at the beginning. It just, it's just not on here because it, well, I just got it and put it on. Okay, but they all have these tails, which is what gives them their names. Okay, so now I want to do, um, we're going to do another poll. And I'm going to show you another picture. And I'm going to show you different pictures of swallowtails. Um, but I'm going to show you the female swallowtails and I'm going to see if you can guess which one this is. Okay. So, and I'll leave it up, but, um, I don't think this is on there though, but A is giant, B is pipeline, C is tiger, and D is eastern black. So you can see there's a combination here. I'm going to show you three pictures. So BBD would be black, eastern black, eastern black. I mean, I'm sorry, it would be pipeline, pipeline, Eastern black. You'll see how that works. And I know I'm not going to have, if you need to write down A, B, C, D and what those mean, um, do that. Because I forgot, I should have had that on here. Okay, you guys ready? Okay, so let's go write down what you think it is and I'll come back to this. Okay, here's the, here's the picture. And you're going to do it. This would, I didn't, I forgot the numbers. This would be number one. Number two and number three. You didn't put numbers on. These are female swallowtails. One, one, two, B. three. And I did put so the kinda... A, B, C, D list in the chat. Oh, okay. Good, good. Oh, perfect. Yeah. So you can go into the chat and wow. look up what it was. No. <clears throat> and again, you know. Wow. I don't expect everybody to get this right, by the way. I just thought we'd do a poll, make this more fun. A three is C. <laughs> now I give you guys a couple more, about five or ten more seconds. Mm. Wow. All right, Michelle, how many? We got some answers yet? I mean, we got some people that have done it. How are we doing? And I get people in there. Oh, I was still on mute. I'm sorry. We have 11 out of 11. Oh, okay. Okay. Let's go ahead and show those that. Okay. So here's what we got. Um, we've got one. Let's, oh, no, we've got get half of them thought the first one. Two thought the sec or 33% the second, eight, and then no choice. Okay. So the actual answer to this is number two. Okay. Okay. So let me shut down this little poll here. <clears throat> so the reason why this is important is again, we're talking about, you know, how the female butterflies protect themselves. So this first butterfly, this is the one that's going to throw everybody off. This is a tiger swallowtail. I'm going to go back one so you can see what they look like. This is the male. Okay. And normally the female looks very similar to the tiger swallowtail. But, whoops. But this is called the black morph, the black morph of the tiger swallowtail. And it's a female, the black female morph. So you don't see this very often. But one of the reasons this, this, um, 
mutation has survived is because you know what? It looks like it's the swallowtail on the right, which is the pipemine swallowtail. The pipemine swallowtail is one of those butterflies that eats those toxic plants and has protected itself. And so by by coming up with this same color scheme, it's tricking a lot of the birds to think that it is the pipemine swallowtail. I mean, that's kind of what it we're thinking. The eastern black swallowtail here below the female, she has more blue on here at the bottom as well. And again, it's possible that it's trying to mimic the pipeline swallowtail. I mean, we don't really know this for sure, but but it's it's a uh, you know it's one of the reasons they think that this definitely the tiger morph has lasted so long. And I'll tell you, every year at the herd, I always see this black form the tiger. Morph. It's it's much larger than the pipeline, um, but it's an unusual thing to see and. You know, sometimes when its wings are shut, you can't, it's hard to really tell, but you could see the stripes, you know, maybe through it. Okay, so that's called female mimicry. Okay, so that's, again, one of the ways it, it changes. All right, so another one, um, you guys see the picture. Can y'all see the butterfly hiding in there? Hopefully you, you can if you look right here. Um, you know, we've got a lot of our woodland butterflies or butterflies that camouflage, you know, in the forest and very hard to see. A lot of times you won't see them, you know, unless you walk up and they fly away. Uh, you know, moths do this quite well as well, but our butterflies do also. So in this, here's just some examples of leaf, cam leaf camouflage. Um, here's like three of our butterflies. <clears throat> the question mark, the American snout, and the goat, goat weed leaf wing. And again, all of these would look like leaves on a tree. And I, I saw that we had somebody from Paris on here. So I will mention, because I'm, I'm really just doing local butterflies, but um, in Paris, they also have a butterfly called Comma, uh, which is similar looking to our question mark. And for those that wonder why these butterflies get this name, there is a, if you look down here in the bottom, it's pretty hard to see, but there's like a dash and a dot which gives it the question mark. And, and our cousin out there in East Texas has just the one with just the, the dash on it. It's called the comma. So if somebody was having fun when they decided to make those butterflies. Um, our American snout, this is our only butterfly that we have that has this long, it looks like a nose. But notice how that looks like it could be attached to this plant as a leaf and a, you know, the, the stem portion of the leaf. Um, but it's actually used, um, you know, it's part of it. It's got its tongue at the end of that thing that it uses for, for eating. And it's our American snout butterfly. It's the only snout butterfly we have in the United States. And then we have the goat weed leaf wing butterfly. Um, and again, very leafy looking when it's on a plant. Now, this is what they look like when their wings are open. Notice how different that looks when their wings are open and when their wings are shut. Here's a picture with the wing shut. This was one of the butterflies out in my mulch in my front yard in Allen. This is what it looks like when the wings are open. Shut, open. Notice how different that is and how, how that might startle you if you've not seen that. This is called the flash and dazzle, or I've, I've, I've seen it razzle dazzle. I mean, it's, had, it's got different names to it, but it's the contrast of appearance from a creature. Um, you know, this happens in animals as well, but it's that all of a sudden you see it, all of a sudden it's gone. And if you think about a butterfly, it's only trying to get a second or two ahead of a predator so it can fly off and save itself. So when it's at rest, many butterflies have their wings closed. And if all of a sudden, like you or something gets close to a predator, it may open those wings up, shock that predator enough that it can escape and fly off. Um, Neophobia, which is the fear of something new or unexpected, is what it's, you know, trying to do, right? It's trying to give you that, you know, like somebody jumping out behind the door and scaring you just enough until you figure it out and then they're gone. Now, in flight, um, when they're doing this and they're flying like those, those butterflies in the forest, they fly with their wings open and shut like this, open, shut. You know, you can see it. Now you don't. Think of it as like the fireflies. I'm sure many of you guys hopefully caught fireflies when you were a kid or if you're trying to follow a firefly. You see it, you run to it, and next thing you know, it lights up and it's somewhere else, right? Because you can't track it while it's in the dark. So that's really kind of what it's doing when it's flying through the woods is that if a bird's 
trying to track it <coughs> in flight. When it when it shuts the wings, he loses it. When he opens, it comes back, and, they, and they're not going to fly straight. They're going to fly in, you know, trajectory type of patterns. Um, and so that's that's another way that they can protect themselves while they're flying. All right. So other ones are like eye spots. You know, we have a lot of butterflies with eye spots on them. Um, you know, whether they're open or closed, this is the buckeye, it's beautiful eye spots, the wood nymph, here's an American lady. Um, you know, the eye spots, kind of like that flash and dazzle, is that, you know, again, creatures looking at it, you know, think that it's something bigger when they see eyes like that. So it's, again, to startle and giving them time to get away. It's not going to trick them long term, you know, just sitting there staring at it, but it's, it's like it's something quick. Now, on the next one, um, these are some of our butterflies with the smaller spots, the smaller eye spots. But you'll notice that's a very common um, trait that many of our butterflies have adapted to have is, is spots or different, different colors. Um, one thing, just uh, kind of an identification thing, a lot of people have trouble telling the difference between the painted lady and the American lady. Uh, if the wings are shut, one of the things to remember is that American ladies have large eyes. And so here's the painted lady. See the, the eye spots here and then the four small there. If I go back one, here's the American lady. See how much larger the eye spots are? So that's kind of one way to remember that. And then I don't think I have in this presentation a picture of the, the tawny emperor butterfly. This is the hackberry emperor butterfly. But the way you can tell those apart is that this first bar right here has a hack between it. Anyway, that's the way you can tell it between the hack green and the tawny. I mean, they do have different colorations, but sometimes that's not always true. All right, so now we're down to our, um, these are some of the butterflies with, with these are our um, hair streak butterflies. And I'm going to get a video on one of these. I just haven't done it yet. But these land on a plant. They're, they're about the size of a quarter. And they usually land upside down and their back part here, if you've seen them, they rub their wings together like this when they're eating. And what they're doing is they're, you know, if something's going to attack them while they're eating and not paying attention, chances are it's going to attack their backside like this example. And it's going to be able to survive with its head intact. You will see a lot of hair streak butterflies that have chunks taken out of the backside but they only really need about 50% of their wings to survive. Um, so this doesn't do them any harm. All right, so some of the, the winter strategies, you know, where do the butterflies go in the winter? Um, you know, again, we're talking about all our local butterflies for the most part. We do have some of them that migrate. <clears throat> the monarch, as many people know, migrates and if you're not paying attention, um, now through the end of October is the peak. I'd say really October 6th, 7th will be the peak of monarch migration coming through Texas. So if you pay attention, and if you don't have flowers in your yard now, I mean, this is the time to have flowers, but if you don't have any, pay attention when you're driving around. You'll see them out there more likely in October. It's been so hot that I think they're, you know, they're going to be a little delayed. They're probably likely more like the you know, first week or middle of October. But the, mo the monarch's winter strategy is to migrate to Mexico and, um, you know, winter in the, the in uh, Michoacan um, in the trees up on the hill. It's a common temperature. That's what that's what they do. Um, we have some other butterflies, the queen, fritillary, and American snout. Um, this is uh, not our local one, but, but the American snout that will migrate one direction. So they will migrate starting from the south in the in the, the spring and just start migrating up. And once the freeze hits bad enough, they just all die. Okay, that's that's the way that works. Um, <clears throat> if we don't if we have a mild freeze in our area, you might see that the fritillaries are pretty quick to come back because they can take cooler weather. But if we have a really hard freeze for you know a week or so it's going to be a long time till you see them again. And people are like, what happened to them? Where'd they go? Well, they're having to migrate up again. And they're migrating, you know, a little bit of time as the season warms and the plants, you know, come up and so forth. Um, we have 
many butterflies, you know, in our area that, that are here year round. Um, the morning cloak and the American is about, and then this is a little different variety here, live year round in our area. They hide in cracks in the trees. And this is what the morning cloak looks like. Um, it's actually an adult for 10 months of its life. Um, but we hardly ever see it because normally these are in the forest and they're hiding and they're very secretive. I don't see it very often. Um, but a lot of them will go into their chrysalis. So like the swallowtails will go into their chrysalis form. Um, they do this. They also do this as they, it's, it's kind of interesting as surviving throughout the season <clears throat> is that they'll make chrysalis during the summer. And then some of them, when it starts to cool down, they'll they'll come out you know, i mean normally if a chrysalis comes out about every two weeks to three weeks but sometimes they'll stay in their chrysalis for two or three months and then they'll come out in september make caterpillars again and go back into a chrysalis and stay the whole winter and then come out the next spring so there's a lot of variety in how they, they use their chrysalis for that um, and then from caterpillars here's some of our local butterflies that will stay in a caterpillar the whole season and it's interesting on some of these, the, the Henry's elephant is the one that's on our redbud trees. If you happen to get that, it makes its, you know, caterpillars in the redbud leafage. And as the leaves fall to the ground, if you're one of those people that rakes up your leaves and throws them in the trash, you know, it's, it's possible there's next year's butterflies there or next year's, you know, insects or other creatures that are hiding in the leaf litter. So I always tell everybody, I mean, I always leave the leaves, you know, on the ground or, we got to stack them up somewhere, um, you know, because there's a lot of life in there that we don't realize um, that's there for, you know, next year. And then there's eggs, Here's the couple of the hair streaks I just put in here. I haven't listed all the butterflies, but just a couple of the hair streaks that, that their eggs stay in winter form in the leaves. And again, if the leaves fall off the tree, then, you know, they're in the leaf litter. All right. So, um, that's kind of the end of most of what I was going to talk about. Here's some of the definitions that we went through. Um, I, I don't think I mentioned dimorphism. That's the, yeah, I mentioned it. I just didn't say the word. That's how the males are more brightly covered than the females. Um, the diamatic patterns are like the, you know, the stripes or the, the different um, colorations of the butterflies. And then we, we talked about the other ones as well. Here's some of the references. And I brought in, let me see what I did with that. People always ask me what I use um, for uh, reference. <clears throat> this, this is a, a book I had bought that talks a lot about butterfly behavior. Um, this is the Dallas County Lepidopterist Society run by Dale Clark. He, he, um, this is more for butterfly identifications, but I like it because it's, it's all about more Texas butterflies don't have other stuff in there and like every plant that they can lay eggs on even native non-native except etc et and then I use a lot on the Wikipedia etc um, if you're into identifying butterflies which we did not spend a lot on this time I look this is my favorite pamphlet here you guys can see that it's called the butterflies of North Texas and it's just a leaflet <clears throat> a laminated pamphlet that shows um, the different butterflies, the caterpillars, their host plants, and so forth, and it's small enough to carry with you. They sell these at the herd if anybody's ever looking for them. And then I'd say this is where you could find me in the summers, but we're at end of season for uh, the butterfly house and at the herd. But this is where I've learned a lot as well. I spent a lot of time up there just observing butterflies, watching them, learning. Um, and it's just kind of one of my things I'm passionate about. So, if there's any questions, that's the end of the formal presentation. You can either come off mute or. Thank you, ask Melanie. Them. That was great. Absolutely wonderful. I have never heard of some of these things. Lovely. Well, Thank good. you. Well, that was the intention, was to try to give you guys some stuff that's maybe not the normal, you know, everyday butterfly talk. Uh, yeah, definitely you not. Know, give you some more nuggets you can pull out on a trail or whatever you're doing, right? 
Um, that's really kind of what I wanted to do. Hi, Melanie. Hey, Bill. This, this is Tony. Tony. Well, why does it say Bill? I don't know how that happens, but <laughs> any of that qu question for you. First of all, what an interactive learning experience this presentation has been. Thank you so much for sharing it. Uh, do you know anything or can you share with us anything about the new butterfly house at the herd? <laughs> well, oh. it's, 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 in, it's in the thought process. Let's just put it that way. Oh, I thought um, it was further along than that. Darn. No, no. Um, Amy Monroy, who's the horticulturist there, is really kind of in charge of that. And she's got a lot of great ideas. And, and we want to take, for those that have been to the butterfly house, you know, it's kind of past its prime and, but you want to build something more vertical and square versus round. And um, she's got a lot of ideas for that, but it's, it, it's not something I don't expect to have that next year. So Tony, but it's uh, coming. I mean, at least it's on the agenda. So uh, I'm happy about that. Uh -huh. uh, Tony, uh, I have some information on that. Um, oh, oh yeah. The, that's the real bill. Yeah. That, that looks like Francis. I, I'm going to bring suit against Tony for imitating me, but uh, we'll talk about that <laughs> later. Um, so uh, we, we received a $50,000 grant uh, toward the Butterfly House uh, uh -huh. and another $10,000. Uh, and so oh, awesome. anyone who wants to contribute to that, and I, and I hope some of you do, who are interested in butterflies, please send a check uh, to the <laughs> Bird Museum and specify uh, that it's for the Butterfly House, because I imagine a decent butterfly house is going to be upwards of a hundred thousand uh, dollars, but we so, as you know, so sorely need to replace what we have now. And Melanie, that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thanks. I think the butterfly house at the herd. I mean, it's one of the few that I know of that really just showcases the native butterflies. Um, so we're we're very. I mean, that's got the inside kind of area as well. So we're we're really lucky to have that in our you know area so it's very it's very nice what other questions or comments or have you observed any other things i know i didn't cover everything so well the most interesting comment thing that i saw was the caterpillars that change colors depending on what they were eating i, mean, oh, yeah. I had no knowledge of that i agree that yeah, was interesting that was, that was pretty cool yeah one thing i noticed about those caterpillars too and again this is just my observations it's hard to verify if it's actually fact or not but because they're on those partridge pea plants and if you're familiar with partridge peas you'll know they have um what do they call them extra floral what extra floral nectaries or something but they're the little bitty um like plates little tiny cups on the the plant that allow the ants to get nectar without going into the flower and i always noticed that those caterpillars as they got bigger would be on the very tips of the plants and I didn't know if it had anything to do with that. You know what I mean? Because it was it was past those extra floral victories. Um, but it's just something I always wondered about. But I never could find anything on that. So I think there's lots still to be learned, you know, just like with any insects, right? I mean, even though butterflies are highly studied, there's a lot of behavioral things that, you know, we still don't know about. Or maybe somebody knows and it's in their head somewhere, right? But it's not, you know, widely available. So I always, always find it interesting on the, the observations. Well, Any other questions? Or, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, this is Mary Ann Lynch. Hey, um, great presentation. So I, I have a question for you. So as, I mean, this probably happens to a lot of people. I'll have like a bunch of root plants so I can feed the swallowtails. And of course they will just, you know, lay a billion eggs on there and they'll eat my root plants down to literally nothing. And so I'm always kind of curious the even when the, before the plant is maybe completely gone, it just seems like caterpillars that don't seem quite large enough. will just sort of, yeah. Hit. So, so let me ask you again, is it a root plant or are you talking about pipeline? Just, just to make sure I got the, because I haven't heard that on a rue plant. Okay, rue. so these are it's, like swallowtails. Yeah, it's for like the <clears throat> the eastern black swallowtail. Okay, I'd be like yeah, so, for like parsley or fennel. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. So, 
so first of all, a lot of the butterflies like to lay on small emerging plants because that's where the tender growth is. You know what I mean? I mean, that's that's one of the things. Like in a monarch on a milkweed, you know, they're laying them when the milkweed's like an inch tall. But the plant, but they're only laying like one inch there, right? Um, if you get a lot of them, it just makes me think that the butterflies in the area can't find enough plants to deposit their eggs on. So are you like in the middle of the city or country or? Oh, <clears throat> well, in, in Fairview, but in a development, okay. yeah. Okay. So I mean, like plant four of them and they never really get huge before they get okay. massacred. So they're because they're, they're getting a lot of whether, whether any Whether any of these caterpillars that look like they haven't quite reached the size as the, of the ones earlier are big mm -hmm. enough to actually form a chrysalis. But it can only happen well, on their last N-star. Right. In the right. They'll, they'll crawl off the plant when they're ready to do that. But I'd say in, in most cases, it's funny because I always tell people that, I mean, people that have dill have the same problem as they eat the dill really fast and always suggest root because it lasts longer. I mean, yeah. I have root plants in the backyard that are four feet tall, no, not, well, three feet tall. So it it just sounds like they're not getting started. Maybe you want to bring one in a pot in the house and, you know, get it going a while. Um, you know, because I really haven't heard it a lot on root, but, but, you know, obviously they're, they're eating it. So I don't know other than to net a few of them and not let them on or <laughs> I don't know if anybody else has other ideas. Maybe try some parsley. Parsley's pretty good at growing. They, they eat parsley. You, you know, know different. It's, it's ironic. I've never had the small tails get um parsley plants, but also okay. Rue, Rue does well, really well in the summer and parsley <laughs> and fennel, they all die off in the summer. So well, actually, like, if, it, if it has some shade, it, it won't go all summer. But what, what, what you could do if they don't eat that, you can move the larger caterpillars to that. You know, or the smaller, you know, the smaller cow, either way, you know, to that. And try to get them to feed off of that one as well if you're mm -hmm. running out. Mm -hmm. um, I, I grow different plants like that just to move caterpillars if I have to. I'd say normally it's easier to to move a baby cat. Well, I don't know. You'd have to test that out. Um, yeah. It seems so like when I've tried to move them before, like from a, a fennel to a dill or vice versa, it seems like they've already formed a taste for whatever plant they were laid on. And they're like, kind of like, yeah, sure. this isn't what I want to eat. <laughs> I don't know. No, you're, you're right. I mean, they don't necessarily want to, but if that's all they got, mm -hmm. then they'll, they'll they're die. They're going to die either way. Um, yeah. So there's somebody else saying, yeah, they haven't seen the room, but they've, they've I got like fennel. Last year, I was, or the year before last, I was still on the farm and all of my rue got totally eaten down and killed. And this year, same thing. None hmm. of my rue, none of, all my rue. I would try parsley. Are they full sun? Hmm? Are they, are they full sun? Uh, they're, no, well, they, they get some mixed part sun. So maybe try parsley again. I, I, I mean, there's curly part. There's a lot of different types of parsley. Or mm -hmm. you could try, I mean, dill, I would not suggest because that plant is always eaten down because it's so fine. But yeah, there's just not a lot of leaves on the dill. <laughs> yeah. No, exactly. I don't know anything other than that. I'm trying maybe to add, you know, a few other things to it and just see what you can figure out on that. I do know it's funny, like I'll have you know, certain plants and they won't ever lay anything on it and then talk to somebody else and that's all they lay on it. So it's definitely, you know, not one size fits all. You just kind of have to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I'm but yeah, to... you're the first person I've ever heard that their root gets eaten all the time. But again, it sounds like they're small plants and they're not getting a chance to really go. I mean, I've even had to happen with root plants that were multiple years old that were quite large. And then, um, yeah, yeah. You got the root loving uh, butterflies over there. <laughs> I so. Maybe okay. I just need to plant a lot more and then keep some of them caged. Well, I would put some, you know, in your, you know, in a pot and put it, you know, in a protected area and let it get bigger. So as they start to eat the other one down, then you can take the pot out there 
and let them transfer over. You know what I mean? You kind of like yeah. got a backup plan. Yeah. Uh, you know, oh. we do that at the herd in the butterfly house when they eat them down. We'll have another pot going and bring it in. It's a different situation, but, mm -hmm. you know, it's the same thing ha happening. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. And Terry, you said you've got eight root plants. They don't like full minor out. So that's interesting. I, I don't know if there's a difference in root plants, but mine are in my backyard that's unwatered in full west sun. And it's been there for four years. It comes back every year. So I don't I don't know why it wouldn't like the, the sun. I mean, they do like the shade. I'm not saying they don't, but you know, again, it may just be types of soil. Um, mine get good drainage where they are. Um, but I did find, um, even in Allen, when I used to plant root, about every three, four years, you know, they just die. You got to replant them. But the good news, they only cost like three or four bucks, which is kind of nice. Okay, so she says maybe because they were all young. That could be it. Uh, you know, it was a, it was a hard, you know, it was a hard year for plants this year. Uh, but once they're established, you know, rue is a very, I mean, it's a very drought resistant plant here. Okay, anything else? All right, we'll just so. make sure, make sure for everybody that you know, watch for the monarchs. They're they're be coming in, and um, if anybody's got questions, I'm usually up at the herd. You know, different times, or I put my I'm butterflies for fun on um, INAT. Although I actually technically am in Grayson County now, so um, you know I'm kind of a little out of the ways. But you know, feel free to send me here. I'll put my email in here. I don't know if you can. I'm happy for people to ask questions or whatever I can do 